Okay, welcome to chapter eight, the special senses. Um, this is uh, this will kind of conclude the part of the nervous system part, um, and uh, before we move on to other topics. But uh, the special senses, it, it may sound like it's a difficult topic to really understand, but relatively straightforward, um, and uh, not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, one thing that I will point out is that um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in talking about some of the some of the structures of of different parts uh, of the, like the eye and those types of things and the muscles that move it. Um, I, I would encourage you to make sure that you read and you study those in your book. But you know, uh, basically, it's just this is what this is and this is what that is. It's kind of like back with that muscle chapter um, where I opted not to just stand up here and point to muscles and call them out and tell them what tell you what they are. Um, much the same way, I kind of. Um, cut this chapter down, at least the lecture side of it, down um, to where that I'm not going to specifically talk about those things. Um, I'm not saying they're not important. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, me just standing up here and regurgitating that information is really not going to be of any help to you. Um, and it's just um, talking about something for the sake of talking about it uh, rather than actually spending time um, helping you understand conceptual things. Okay? So r read through that part of that stuff and understand that part. Um, and then we're going to start, we'll start a little, a little ways into uh, the lecture on the eye. I'm not really sure which page it would be in your book, but um, it would be a little bit deeper into the, the chapter 8 than, than where we normally would start. So um, in talking about the senses, when we're talking about the special senses, uh, smell, taste, sight, hearing, and equilibrium, we're going to talk about all of those to certain degrees, you know, to varying degrees, um, some of these are a little tougher to understand. Some of them we're not going to talk about all there is to know about them, especially sight. That's one of the more difficult ones to really comprehend what's going on there. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the structures and things that are present and what kind of what they're doing, um, what they're sensing, so we can kind of get an idea of how they work. So um, skipping on ahead, like I said, we're going to skip to the layers that form the wall of the eyeball. So I want to get to the eyeball. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking a lot about the structures around it and the tear ducts and the uh, muscles that, that turn the eye and those types of things. Um, that's a whole lot of just anatomical things that you can just as easily uh, uh, make some flashcards or something like that and learn those things kind of on your own without, you know, me standing up here, like I said, just regurgitating that stuff. So when we look at the eye, we look at cross section of the eye, there's three layers. There's a fibrous outer layer a vascular middle layer that has all the blood vessels and all that. And then we have the inside layer that's the sensory layers where all the action happens where, uh, where the vision takes place more or less. Um, and then of course there's some fluids that fill that interior part of the eye um, that keep it at shape and help it maintain its shape. Um, and they're called humorous fluids. I have no idea why they're humorous, um, uh, uh, but uh, for some reason that's what they call them, humorous. Apparently there was something funny about them when they discovered them. So here's a cross section of the eye, um, and we can see the different layers, you know, the vascular layer, and that inside that yellow layer right there that we can see, that layer right there is where vision actually takes place, and, and that's broken down into a couple more layers as well uh, that we're going to look at, and we're going to talk about those layers in particular. Um, but right here, um, uh, right, right where the vessels come into the eyeball, um, right back here where those come into the eyeball. Um, you notice that the yellow part of this actually dips in. Well, the sensory, um, uh, the sensory cells are on the inside of this right here. Well, notice this dips in this way. So there's no sensory cells right here. So this is what is considered the blind spot of the eye. So you do have an actual a spot within the eyeball itself that there's no sensory organs, there's, there's no sensory cells that can receive a signal from the light that comes through the eye. So uh, I didn't want to miss talking about that. I may mention it again later, but I was, I was afraid that I would overlook it. So uh, the sclera is the white part of the eye. It's the connective tissue layer, and it's the white part of the eye that we see. The cornea is the transparent central anterior portion that the light passes through. Um, it heals and, and repairs itself pretty easily, so... Um, it, it's uh, fairly resilient, um, and it's the only human tissue that can be transplanted without rejection. So it's kind of inter interesting that 
Corneal transplants don't require rejection medication. We can transplant those and they will do just fine without, without the need of that. Um, remember that inside yellow layer now, that retinal layer that I talked about, remember it's, it's in two layers. So the outer layer is the pigmented layer that absorbs light um, and prevents the light from scattering. So the outer layer actually helps keep the light staying in a particular direction or a focal direction so that it doesn't just kind of shower out everywhere inside of the eye. And that inner layer is the neural layer. It contains those receptor cells called photoreceptors. Um, and those photoreceptors are rods and cones. You've probably heard of those before. Um, but those are the photocells within the eye, within that layer of the eye, uh, that allow us to be able to see. Not only see, but see in color as well. All right, so the signals pass from those photoreceptors, those cells, the rods and cones, into these bipolar neurons and then these ganglion cells, and then they go out of the retina towards the brain through the optic nerve. And that disc there, right where that goes out of the eyeball, is that blind spot that I talked about. And if, uh, if, there, if we try to focus an image right there, we're not going to see it. Um, here's just another, here, here's just a layer, kind of a, a piece of that layer that shows the nerves um, within those, bi you know, the, the nerves inside of there, the ganglion and the bipolar cells. Um, and that, that's what this picture is representing. So we got our rods and cones here, and we can see those rods and cones, and they're, and they're named that according to their shape. Notice that we see a whole lot more rods than we do cones. Um, that, that's just the way that it is in our eye. We have these bipolar cells here, and then we have these ganglion cells here that actually are uh, a nerve cell, you know, a nerve that's going on down. So for each rod and each cone, there's a, a nerve cell that's attached to it that's receiving a signal that's going to the brain. Okay, and then we've got these bipolar cells that are kind of like, a, you know, remember back to the last chapter, we talked about interneurons. It's a bipolar cell. It's really transmitting this signal from here to here, um, and uh, um, it's, uh, it's making sure that signal is strong enough to, to stimulate this nerve and move on as part of its job of what it does. So um, it, it kind of acts a little bit like an interneuron when we talked about arc reflexes in the last chapter. That's, that's similar to what it's doing. Um, and then we can see a little closer look, of those, a look at those layers of, uh, of, of how that works, of how those work. All right. So, um, uh, let me see. I want to back up here, I think, just a little bit. Um, and we see those, we see these layers right here. But what's odd about this is you would think that these layers here would be facing the front of the eye, but they're really not. They're facing the back of the eye. If we look at this right here, we can see that same layer that was right here, okay? So these are kind of facing the back of the eye. Um, this little pigmented layer right here keeps, kind of brings the light in and allows it to stay, you know, when it, when it comes in here, it keeps it from scattering out in all different directions. So it kind of keeps it focused. Um, so that, that layer helps kind of keep things a little bit focused. Um, and then all these nerves kind of cross along here. So it's a little bit, Different. You would think that all of this would be on this side of it and not on this side, but that's the way that it is. Um, uh, it's uh, made a little different. The eye's a little different than what you would think. Okay, so the cells within the eye that are responsible for vision in, inside of the retina and how that vision works, one of those two, remember, had rods and cones. The first one is the rods. Um, uh, they're most toward the edges of the retina, which is where we find them, more, more along the edges of it. Um, and they allow for dim lighting in a peripheral vision and a, a perception of gray tones. There's a lot of those, though. Remember, there was quite a few of those in there, but they're mostly towards the edges of the retina. Cones allow for detailed color vision. Um, they're strongest at the center. Um, and at the, at the center of the retina, we'll find that more of them there. Um, and uh, they are, I was trying to think, they are actually help us with uh, visual acuity, having really sharp vision. Um, and there's no photoreceptor cells at the optic disc at that blind spot like I've talked about. Uh, I, honestly, I thought I was afraid that I was going to leave that out and not mention that. And this is the third slide that said that. So there, I guess there wasn't a chance of me missing talking about the blind spot. So pretty sure we got the blind spot well covered. 
So rods and cones. Um, so uniqueness is about cones itself. There are three types of cones. So we have two types of photocells, rods and cones, and then there's three types of cones. Um, they have they have different sensitivity to different wavelengths, um, uh, wavelengths of color specifically, um, red, blue, and green. So these guys are the ones that are responsible for color blindness because of the lack of one type of those cones. If we're missing one or two of those cones, then we we have a condition called color blindness, and we can't distinguish um, uh, green from red. Uh, you know, um, may may sound like not too big of a deal, but uh, look at the look at a stoplight, or think of, about a stoplight, and where's red? Which light is red, and which light is green on a stoplight? Most of us realize that the bottom light is the green light, and the top light is the red light. But go to Texas when they turn their stoplight sideways instead of up and down, and then try to figure out which one is red and which one is green, and see how many lights, how many red lights you go through before the police stop you, and you figure out, oops, I had the wrong color. Um, I had a friend of mine that that happened to. It's kind of a funny story. But cones have to do with uh, uh, seeing color. They're, they have to do with our color vision. The lens of the eye is a bivex crystal-like structure, um, and it's held in place by ligaments that attach it um, to, the, to the body. Um, when, uh, when that lens becomes hard um, and, and opaque colored uh, as we get older, it's a condition called cataracts. Um, and the vision starts to become difficult. It's like almost trying to look through milk or milky colored lenses. Um, and eventually it'll cause blindness of that affected eye. Um, it is treatable to a degree. Um, but there are some risk factors associated with that, such as diabetes, exposure to uh, high exposure to intense sunlight, heavy smoking, those kinds of things can um, increase your risk for uh, cataracts. Um, there's a cataract. Sometimes we see poor little dogs or cats with cataracts as they get older. Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do for our pets with cataracts, at least that I know of. Um, but uh, for people, there is surgery. They go in there and they, they clean that cataract out and a lot of times put a, put a, a lens of sort in there um, to correct that. So that lens actually divides the eye into two chambers. We have an anterior and a posterior chamber. The anterior chamber is the aqueous chamber. Um, it is anterior to the lens, so it's in front of the lens, and it contains the aqueous humor. Um, and we'll talk about the aqueous humor here in a minute. And then there's a posterior, posterior vitreous chamber that contains the vitreous humor. It's behind the lens. So the focusing part of the eye. So we have a fluid in front of that and a fluid behind that. Okay. Um, the aqueous humor, the fluid in front of the lens, is a watery fluid um, similar to blood plasma, so it's not real thick. You know, it's a kind of a, a thin watery matrix. Helps maintain interocular pressure, so it helps maintain the pressure within the eye. That's its purpose there. Provides nutrients to the lens um, and reabsorbs the venous blood. Um, the th thing to think about is, is the lens is a, is a living thing. It has living cells in it. It's not a piece of plastic that was put there by your eye doctor. Um, so it has cells that need to survive. Remember we talked about how cells do their work and they need ATP, which is oxygen and glucose and all that. Well, the lens of the eye is no different. It needs to, it needs to have nutrients. Well, it's clear. So there's no blood vessels in it. Um, if there was blood vessels in it, it wouldn't be clear. It would be probably red, um, which would be weird. Uh, so the way that it gets its nutrients is through this aqueous humor, this watery matrix that's, that's in front of that lens. That's what nourishes that lens and keeps it well, um, healthy and safe. Um, and also this intraocular pressure is important. It's something that the, your eye doctor can measure and make sure that that intraocular pressure is correct. Um, uh, it's because it helps, it's an indication of the health of someone's eye. Uh, behind the lens is the vitreous humor. It's that jelly-like substance um, that prevents the eye from collapsing. It holds the eye's shape, and it helps maintain interocular pressure as well. Whereas the aqueous humor is replaced, the vitreous humor is not. If you lose your eye jelly, you're not going to grow it back. We don't grow more eye jelly. Um, that is not a substance that is actually replaced in the body. Um, 
And I do not know if there is a procedure to fix that if something like that happens or if it just results in the loss of an eye um, if you lose that gel that's in, in that. Oh, what happened here? Well, I'm not sure what's happened, but nothing wants to work for me. Okay, there we go. Got it all fixed up. Technology, isn't it great? Um, so, jelly-like substance behind the, behind the lens is the uh, vitreous humor, and it doesn't grow back, remember? Um, and then uh, what your eye doctor will use is a device called an ophthalmoscope, um, and it's used to illuminate the inside of the eye um, and look at what's going on within the eye. There's a, there's a limited amount of information that they can tell from this, but they can detect certain things such as diabetes, atherosclerosis, degeneration of the optic nerve and retina and those types of things. They can see if a retina has been detached, you know, um, if, uh, if there's been some kind of head injury or something like that and somebody's having trouble or, or they're blind, they can look and see if the retina is still attached. Um, if that retina actually becomes detached, it doesn't reattach and it's, it means permanent blindness, unfortunately. So there's a view with an ophthalmoscope um, looking at, looking inside of the eye um, and uh, we can see the the retina, the optic disc, and we can see those blood vessels running in there. Um, uh, what's interesting is, is that though there's all those blood vessels in there, they don't obstruct our vision um, because of the way that the eye is designed and the way that it views doesn't, it doesn't obstruct it. So, so how do we see things? Well, we see thing based, things based on light reflection. Um, it's a little different way to think about how we see things, but it is the reflection of light off of objects um, that light actually, when it reflects off of objects, um, depending on what color that object is, different things or different wavelengths will be reflected off of that, and that's what our eyes pick up are those light wavelengths. So that light, in order for it to work in our eye, it must be focused at a point on the retina for vision to be optimal. Um, the light as it comes in is bent or it's refract refracted by the cornea, the aqueous humor, the lens and the vitreous humor. So all of those pieces and parts of the eye actually bend the light into a way that it is useful and it can be interpreted by the retina of the eye. Optimal distance for uh, vision is 20 feet. That's why when, they, uh, when you do a vision test, that's why they do it at 20 feet because that's optimal. That's how we're made. Um, now the lens with anything less than 20 feet has to accommodate. It has to change shape in order to be able to see the object, to focus on the object. So objects 20 feet away, we can see with healthy vision, but if our eyes are not able to accommodate, when we move things closer, it gets more difficult. As we get older, this becomes a lot more obvious when uh, we're trying to have things that are right under our nose and we can no longer read them. We have to get reading glasses. It's because our eyes lose the ability to accommodate. Our lens um, begins to get a little thicker and it's a little harder to move that lens so the muscles around the lens can't change the shape of the lens so that it changes focus. The way that we change focus in our eyes is we change the shape of our lens. Um, adjust the shape of our lens and we can change the focal point um, and objects become clearer. So um, uh, one of the, th here's, here's kind of a little bit how it works, but this lens here is going to change, whoops, I'm sorry. This lens, here's the lens here, it's going to change shape um, based on the distance from the object. So as we get older, doing this down here starts to become a lot more difficult. Um, if it's close to us, it starts to become more difficult for us to adjust the shape of our lens. Um, the image on the retina is actually a real image, and they're, from reversed, they're reversed from left to right. They're upside down, and they're smaller than the original object. It's kind of weird what it does, but um, it is uh, um, the, uh, the upside down reversed image of what we're actually seeing. Our brain then takes that image, flips it back over, turns it back the right way, and processes it and, and, and so that we understand what it is that we're looking at. Um, it's amazing that our brain is able to do this, and then we're able to to, to do some minute, finite things with our, with our eyes and see some things that are just amazing things that we see. Um, but as good as our eyes are, they're not the most perfect eyes on the planet. There's eyes that are a whole lot better than ours um, in different lights or different situations, such as 
Um, some, uh, you know, like a lot of the cats and owls and those types of things see better at night. Fish see underwater. Um, those types of things, you know, have just different situations in different ways that um, our eyes work according to what species we are. Um, our visual fields from the right eye to the left eye actually overlap, um, and they help us provide depth perception um, of the objects that we're seeing. Um, this helps us, you know, tremendously in a lot of ways. Um, it was probably, uh, probably originally was a, some sort of a defense mechanism or a protective mechanism. Um, if, if you'll notice too, though, that both of our eyes are on the front, and you know, there's some animals that have eyes that are more towards the sides, um, so they can see down the sides of their body as well as in front of them, so they have a more uh, a vision that's, that more surrounds their bodies um, as a protective mechanism. Ours, on the other hand, is designed more for depth perception, so our eyes, our vision, our focal points actually cross, and they're, they, they cross over each other, and it gives us a lot more depth perception that way. Um, and that green area right there is where we have the greatest level of depth perception because both eyes are, are getting different focal points. So, um, eye reflexes, of course, they're controlled by the autonomic nervous system, just natural internal reflexes. Um, the pupil reflex that uh, you know adjusts to bright and dark and all that kind of stuff is is one of those, and then of course the accommodation where we view objects. So we don't have to actually know how to control our pupils or the muscles of our lenses to to be able to focus and you know shut down when the lights are too bright and that kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of handy. Um, it's kind of like our heartbeat and our breathing and that kind of thing. It's all controlled automatically um, based upon input. Um, that, that, the, that the body receives. So bright light, you know, uh, kind of blinds us and our brain reacts uh, pretty quickly to, to uh, uh, constrict the pupils to let less light in. Um, so, let's see. Right, so uh, good vision, normal vision, when things are seen correctly on the retina, um, and I don't know if I can say this, emetropia, um, is, uh, is what's called normal vision. Myopia is nearsightedness, meaning stuff far away appears blurry. You can see things close up is what nearsightedness is. Um, and uh, hyperopia is objects up close look blurry, um, uh, and distant objects are focused. And we can see because of the shape of the eye what, why these um, conditions exist. Um, unfortunately, these conditions exist at such an extreme that no, no amount of muscle manipulation of the lens of the eye will correct it or overcome that. Um, whereas in a normal eye, focusing, changing focal points is a, is a matter of changing the muscle, the, the, the uh, shape of the lens of the eye to, to accommodate for that. Um, these eye conditions down here on B and C are, are such that the the lens can't overcome that. And what happens is, is we can see on the right-hand side the type of lens that it takes to correct that. So when you go to the eye doctor, that's, that's why the shapes of lenses are different depending on the condition that's going on in the eye and, and all the tests. And they, they determine by running all of those tests and making you look at better one or better two um, based to determine which one works best, um, which is going to be the best way to do it. So. Um, astigmatism is where images are blurry and it results from light focusing um, as lines, not points. So astigmatism has to do with an uneven or an unequal curvatures of the lens and, and the cornea of the eye. Uh, it is a correctable condition, um, but it requires uh, laser surgery of some sort um, with the eye in order to do that. So it is possible to correct it. Um, there are some conditions that exist with eye, some homeostatic imbalances such as night blindness. Um, it has to do with rod function that hinders the ability to see, the, see at night. And of course, color blindness uh, due to lack of one type of cone that causes partial or complete color blindness. Glaucoma uh, causes increased pressure within the eye. A lot of times this is congenital, but there are some risk factors associated that can lead to glaucoma or an increased chance of glaucoma but it has to do with pressures within the eye. These pressures build um, and it begins to damage the, 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 uh, the, uh, no, the um, I'm sorry, the, the photocells within the eye. Uh, 
the hema, hema, hemanopia is the loss of the same side of the visual field in both eyes. It's usually a damage to the visual cortex on one side of the body. Um, could be stroke, could be head injury or something like that that can cause that to happen. Okay? All right, the ear. Ear has two senses, hearing and equilibrium. So it's how we hear and it's how we keep our balance. Um, and there's receptors inside of those ear that are, that are called mechanoreceptors. Um, and different, different organs house the receptors for each one of these senses. So um, while, while it's all part of the ear or the ear system, um, there are different organs within the ear that are responsible for hearing and equilibrium. It's not both, one of them doing both. Three parts is what we divide the ear into, external, middle, and inner ear. Um, and we can see those broken up right here. Um, we can see the how they separate those here. Here's external, middle, and inner, and we can... We can see what's housed in each one of those. Just a good idea to know, kind of have an idea of, of what's housed in each one of them because you never know, uh, you know, uh, with some medical conditions that you need to know, you know, it'll, it'll mention inner, outer, or middle ear. External ear, only for hearing. Um, it has some structures out there. It's got an oracle, which is the big part of the ear an acoustic medius, an auditory canal that funnels the sound in there. It has some wax in there. It's got some hairs in there, and it, and it ends at the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Um, and it's, uh, it's specifically designed to, to uh, carry sound waves into to the tympanic membrane. Um, it's, its goal is to get it to the tympanic membrane. Of course, there's ears and uh, ears. There's hairs and wax in there. Um, uh, as a protection mechanism um, because it is an opening in the body and it needs to be protected, but it also needs to be an opening so that sound can travel in, so it has to have some protective measures there. The middle ear is an air-filled cavity involved only in the sense of hearing, so it's only a hearing sense, um, and it's located between the tympanic membrane and the oval window uh, and the round window, which we'll look at that. So. Um, obviously, between the outer ear and the middle ear, it is an air-filled cavity. Um, this is that cavity that when your sinuses and all that stuff are backing up and you feel pressure in your ears, this is that cavity that, that starts to get that pressure changes, is where that pressure change is sensed. Um, and then we've got these auditory tubes that, are op that open from the auditory canal, um, and then the, they, uh, they allow equal that equalizing pressure um, within that, the inner ear. Three bones of the middle ear. Um, we have the malleus, incus, and stapes, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Um, those are those are all um, all very testable um, questions. They're all really good questions for a test. So know what the three of those are. Um, uh, basically, they bring my vibrations from that tympanic membrane, the membrane that separates the outer and the middle ear, um, and they cause a vibration among those three things. Um, that translates to the inner ear. Um, and that translation into the inner ear is actually gonna, going to cause uh, a nerve signal impulse to happen that's going to send a signal to the brain that the brain's going to be able to interpret the sounds that it's hearing. Um, the inner ear, moving on inside, um, includes organs for both hearing and balance. So it's, this is the one area where both are concerned. Uh, it's filled with this stuff called paralymph. Um, it's a, it's a, a watery, a, a watery type of fluid um, that, uh, that is kind of bathing inside of those organs. There's, some, a, there's a maze of bony chambers within the temporal bone. Um, one of them is the cochlear, um, the vest, vestibule, vestibule, and the circular canals. Um, and, those, the, and then there's this membranous labyrinth that's suspended, suspended that has that perilymph inside of it, and it also contains some endolymph. Try not to get too crazy about that stuff. Just realize that, uh, that within that, within the inner ear, we've got the cochlea, the vestib vestibule, and the semicircular canals that things happen within. And we can see those things right here um, in this picture. It's a pretty good picture of them. Um, we can see the cochlea, vestibule, and the semicircular canals, these little canals that are sticking up here. 
Um, we also see this really, really innervated. What's interesting is, is if you look at this nerve, this nerve, how this one ties in here, and these tie in here, okay? The difference is, is this is for hearing, and this is for balance. So you can see the two organs of the ear that they're talking about. Um, if I'm correct, I may have this backwards now that I'm thinking of it. There's a very good chance I have those backwards. <laughs> um, so essentially you've got two organs in there. One is for hearing and one is for balance, and I do think I have them backwards. Um, but uh, it'll, we'll get it sorted out here in just a second just to, just to make sure I'm second-guessing myself. Okay? So the equilibrium part of the inner ear is called the vestibular apparatus. Um, and that has two functions. It, has, it, it gives a static and dynamic equilibrium. Um, yeah, that's the vestibular cochlear nerve. I did have them backwards. Let me, let me fix that real quick. Um, this is for balance. And this is for hearing. Sorry about that. Um, so that's the, the difference between the two. And don't worry, it's not, uh, um, it, it's not like uh, you're going to have a patient that you're going to go, hey, look, there's their you know, vestib vestibular whatever. Um, <laughs> hopefully you don't see that in your patients. Um, uh, that, that would not be a good thing. So, but that vestibular apparatus has two functions, static and dynamic equilibrium. Um, we see the vestibule here, um, the vestibular nerve, and the semicircular canals. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the top side of this because we're talking about balance. Um, there are some receptors within the vestibule um, that report the position of the head when we move our head, and then they send information via that nerve. Um, and inside that macula, there are hair cells or, or hairs with cells or cells with hair like projections on them um, that. Uh, and, the, and these tiny stones that float around in a gel um, that sense that, that when we move our head, those tiny stones move around and they make contact with those little hairs. And by moving those hairs back and forth, it, it sends a signal to our brain and lets us know where our head is located in space. Um, so really, honestly, that's how it works. It sounds like, you know, you think about all of the other things and all the other ways that um, our body works and the amazing things about our body. And uh, basically, how we manage to keep our equilibrium is because we have rocks in our head. Um, really, we don't, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's called tiny stones but, because that's what they, they resemble, but that's not what they are. Um, it's just interesting how that, that works. Um, and this just gives us an idea of how our, our brain is able to proceed, perceive what's going on with us based upon the movement of those uh, tiny stones in the, in the, the gel-like substance or that, that lymph-like substance. Dynamic, uh, remember that was static. This is dynamic equilibrium. And this has to do with angular and rotary movements. And this ha happens in the crista ampullaris. Um, and there's some hair-like cells in there as well. Um, and there's a gelatinous cap on there, or gel a culpa, a, a, a cupula. Um, and the head moves and drags against the endolymph. So, uh, and then it talks about the little spiral organs of the corti. Um, basically, um, and I was trying to get to it, but you can see this little guy right here. Um, this little guy right here. Um, this nerve right here that's coming into it. Um, and it has to do with the movement inside of, inside of those and how it's moving. Um, this membrane right here on top. And, and I know I'm not being super, super, um, uh, this membrane here. I'm sorry. Yeah, this membrane and this membrane, both of those membranes. Um, I know I'm not being super, super descriptive about what's going on here, um, but I'm just trying to, to help you guys get a general understanding of what's going on, okay? Um, what happens is, is those membranes actually, whoops, those membranes actually cause uh, these, it tr tickles these hairs down here, the movement of those membranes based upon the movement of the fluids, you know, inside of here and here. Um, those fluids actually move around and cause the, those hairs to get, you know, come in contact with. And the brain perceives those as the movement of the body and how the body's moving.
Okay? Um, the way that we hear is in a very similar way as the way that our body perceives movement and, uh, and maintains our balance is it interprets the vibrations from sound waves um, through a membrane. So basically what happens is it takes the sound waves in the air, turns them into a mechanical movement, and that mechanical movement um, causes movement within the fluid of the ears that causes the hairs with hair-like um, cells in the ears to become bent, and that is how we perceive sound, this, which causes... Um, that in, in the, on the cochlear nerve, it causes an action potential to start. Um, uh, High-pitched sounds disturb the short, stiff fibers. Low-pitched sounds disturb the long, floppy fibers. Um, and as, as that sound, uh, that, that, that snail-like looking thing, um, as the, as the, as the uh, impulse pushes in further, it's going to it's going to stimulate less and less of the um, of the uh, hair fibers further on in unless the sound is loud. The louder the sound, the lo the more it's going to cause the bigger wave, so to speak, that it's going to cause. That's going to go further down inside of there, and that's how we not only determine tone, high and low tone, but loudness and quietness. Um, the the quieter noises, the 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 uh, the more the 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 uh, the hair-like cells are going to be sensed towards more towards the opening or more towards the larger part of that snail-like. I'm going to I, I got to go back and show you what I'm talking about. Um, sorry, I just didn't know if there was a picture. This right, this right down here, um, right here. Um, as this and the, the somewhere in here is where that tympanic mem or that tympanic, you know, um, the stapes or one of them attaches right here and causes this vibration that sends waves in and it sends these waves in here and you know if it's a quiet sound the wave may only get to hear but if it's a little louder it may get to hear if it's even louder it may get to hear or hear or hear and the further in that it that it that it stimulates these hair like projections of cells um, and sends that out on the nerve the louder the brain perceives the sound to the point that it, where it can be so loud that it's actually painful along these nerves um, because it's so loud it's causing such a violent shaking of those hairs that it that it's perceived as being painful um, and it's a defense mechanism or it's a protection mechanism um, we don't want um, uh, to damage those of course deafness is any degree of hearing loss if we uh, if we continually expose ourselves to loud noises it does damage those um, cells and those so cells don't recover um, and there's different types of deafness that's out there um, and, and different areas where it affects. Some of them can actually be corrected with hearing aids or cochlear implants or those types of things. Um, there is also a condition called uh, Marinaire's syndrome that affects the inner ear and causes progressive deafness and sometimes even vertigo because it affects both of those organs. Much like an inner ear infection, if we get an infection of the inner ear that causes additional fluid to build up, Part of the body's response to an infection is they, it sends more fluids and causes the air to become more inflamed as a, as a way to try to protect. But that can also cause some problems within the inner ear because adding fluid to it throws off pressures and throws off fluid amounts. And now all of a sudden, uh, dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, those types of things can happen really easy because the equilibrium is really thrown out of whack. Okay? The tongue. Taste and smell. Uh, the tongue and the nose. Um, both of these senses use chemoreceptors. Remember, we talked a little bit about chemo, uh, chemoreceptors or neurotransmitters. Um, this, chemoreceptors are similar to neurotransmitters in some ways, whereas chemoreceptors actually sense the presence of chemicals. And that sensation of the presence of chemicals causes either us to perceive a smell or perceive a taste based upon that. What's interesting is there are some people out there that perceive tasting something differently than somebody else. Have you ever tasted something and, and it's where somebody said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is the best food I've ever ate. And you taste it and you're like, that tastes like dog food. It's disgusting. It's because your taste sensation, the way that you, you perceive taste um, and how it's translated in your brain is different than them. Um, so it is entirely possible um, that you 
perceive a taste differently than somebody else and vice versa. So it's all done based off of the, off of the chemicals that are present within whatever it is that we are eating. Uh, it's also interesting that there are some chemicals um, within, with, that can be within some foods or some things that we eat with it will almost immediately cause a gag reflex and cause us to vomit. For instance, if we go to eat something that is um, rotten, um, and once our, if, if the smell, if we, if we don't notice the smell and it makes it to our taste buds, there's some taste buds that'll sense the chemicals in that and say, whoa, no, don't take that and we need to get that out of here and it'll make us throw up. Um, so uh, our, our brain's a, an amazing thing in how it perceives and it interprets these chemical signals that it receives. With the sense of smell, those receptors are located in the roof of the nasal cavity, um, and they're known as olfactory hairs that detect chemicals. Um, these, uh, the chemicals have to be dissolved in mucus for the detection to actually work. Um, these, these cells actually are very sensitive, but they tire pretty easily. So the longer they're exposed to a particular chemical, the less they're going to respond to it. They start to ignore it after a while. They're not going to pay any attention to it. Um, interpretation of those smells is made in the cortex. So uh, we can see an, an example of this right here. And I want to point this out to, to uh, uh, any of the uh, EMT students or anybody that's planning on going to, uh, um, on to paramedic school. One of the procedures that we can do in the pre-hospital setting that we don't do so much anymore, and, and for good reason, but it is an emergency procedure, and, and we do it if it's absolutely necessary, is we take a, uh, an, an endotracheal tube or an ET tube, and we run it up into the nose to where that it'll go down here into the trachea, all right? Um, and then we can breathe for somebody that's otherwise not breathing. We do this when we, when we have somebody that's got a little bit of an intact gag reflex, um, and we need to get an airway in them, or they're semi-conscious, but they're not controlling their airway well. The problem with this is, is a lot of times when we're inserting this ET tube, it can actually come up here and damage these nerves. Um, and, if, and, we, and it is entirely possible to damage those nerves to a point that they don't ever repair correctly. Um, so it's something that we need to be fully aware of when we're, when we're doing a procedure like that. And there's a specific way that we do that procedure. If we follow the way that we're supposed to do it, 99% um, of the time we don't cause damage. Um, but we need to be cautious of that, uh, you know, so that we don't cause damage to somebody because those nerves are actually exposed. Um, it's one of the few places that the nerves are actually exposed in a way that we can easily damage them. Taste buds, on the other hand, they are receptor organs as well. Um, most of them are on the tongue, but there are some in the cheeks and in the soft palate. Um, um, and, and the, of course, the tongue is covered with these little projections called papillae. Um, uh, they don't, they, um, let's see, some of them have taste buds, some of them don't. Um, there, there's some that are rounded, some are large, some are sharp, and that kind of thing. But, um, but there are also taste buds found on the side of the papillae, so we can see um, uh, kind of an idea of where some of these taste buds are located. And they've done research trying to determine which taste buds for sweet and sour and salty and all that stuff are located where. And, and they, just when they say they think they've got it figured out, they, they go, well, wait, it's different on this guy, so um, it may not be actually as concrete. So what happens, though, is, is we take something in our mouth um, and we uh, dissolve it. it. It's dissolved or it's, the saliva helps it actually get down into these grooves inside of the tongue where these taste buds can actually sense the chemicals that are present in it. Um, obviously, our taste buds are very well adept at, at sensing salt and sugar because both of those things, remember we talked about sodium potassium pump and how important sodium potassium pump is. Um, and and you, so you guys should be familiar with that. Um, we've also talked about glucose and its role in the production of ATP or cellular energy. So sugar and salt are both things that the body feels are important. So there is a lot of dedication to the sensing of sugar and salt in the foods that we eat. Um, therefore, there's a lot of taste buds that actually sense sugar and salt because we crave or we look for those objects. Um, and, it, and it's a way that we can, you know, perceive that we're receiving the things that we need, um, an, an adaptive mechanism that our bodies have had. All right, so these uh, receptors have long hair-like projections on them. 
and they're stimulated by the chemicals that are present around them, and that's what causes them to send a signal to the brain. Um, and then it, this, is, this just gives us an idea of which one of those cranial nerves actually carry the sense of taste to the brain. Um, and those, but those taste buds are oftentimes replaced. Uh, drink a hot cup of coffee and you can't taste anything for a couple of days. Uh, your taste buds will recover. Um, um, so uh, we're able to sense sweet things, sugars, saccharin, all that kind of stuff, sour. Um, actually, the sour receptors are a response to uh, hydrogen ions or acids present. That's typically, well, that's what, hap that's what we're sensing is the hydrogen ions. Um, bitter, which is alkaline. Um, salty uh, as, as metal ions. And uh, the, there's some that respond to amino acids as well. All right, so um, of when we're developing as we're growing from an infant to an adult, um, of our special senses, vision is the one that requires the most learning. Um, it's the toughest one. It's also the slower, a little bit slower to develop. Um, and it's not quite as vital early on in infants as it begins to become later on in life. Um, but an infant has very poor visual acuity. Um, don't have color vision or depth perception at birth. They just don't have the ability to do that. Um, and the eye will continue to grow and mature until about the age of eight or nine. So um, most of the time, there are times though, I mean, a lot of times we wind up with little ones wearing glasses to protect things or to uh, uh, correct things um, that, are, that are noticed at a young age, such as um, cross-eyed and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of the, a lot of times, you know, you'll hear the eye doctor say, "Hey, if we start this now, by ten or eleven, they may not need glasses anymore because we can fix this." There are some conditions that that actually happens with. There are others that, doggone it, um, we're just stuck with it. Um, as we get older, um, we start to have some other vision-associated problems, such as glaucoma, presbyopia, cataracts, atherosclerosis of the blood vessels. Um, or, you know, the old vision, the presbyopia, um, results from a decrease in lens elasticity like I've talked about. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa are having to carry around reading glasses or they got bifocals or that kind of thing uh, so that they can read because they're no longer able, their uh, lens is no longer able to adjust and focus to things closer up. Okay? Um, newborn infants can hear sounds but their responses are more reflective, you know, like startle reflex. Toddlers, um, they can listen uh, critically at the beginning um, to imitate sounds. And then, of course, as we get older, um, sometimes those senses start to fail us. Um, uh, sometimes the ossicles of the ears fuse and we, and we have deafness because of that or because of uh, environmental factors sometimes cause some deafness as well. Uh, taste and smell are most accurate at birth and decrease af after about the age of 40. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, taste and smell starts to kind of go away. Um, that's why sometimes when you go into an, an, an older person's home, you know, in the 70s and 80s, sometimes it's got a little bit of a funky smell in there and you're like, why don't they smell this? Well, they don't smell it just because they don't smell it. Um, uh, they're they're, they're long, no longer capable of being able to smell that. So... Um, it's difficult for them to smell it. Okay, perfect. That is chapter eight. Um, I will see you guys at chapter nine.